good to go. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you. Got a little echo. How's that? It's wonderful to see you on this beautiful long weekend, the most sunshine and warmth and lovely start to this uh, summer season. So uh, wonderful to have people here and join us at Pacific Spirit United Church. My name is Deborah Lang and I'm one of the ministers here. Um, I have a couple of announcements, and one is this is your last opportunity. If you haven't had a chance to sit in our sample chairs, uh, they're at the front, and you can do that after the service. We're going to be uh, making a decision to purchase some additional chairs, so your input is very valuable to the committee who's been working really hard on that. So at the end of the service, if you'd like to come up, they'll have some sheets to, for you to fill out your preferences, and you can do that. Secondly, on June 5th, we are having um, a time for people who would like to join the church to come and make that statement and commitment and have that welcome. So we have some people who are ministers whose membership was in the region and they're coming to join the congregation. We have some people who are coming, transferring from other churches. And we have some people who, uh, who would like to just come and be a member for the first time. Now, you can be a member whether you've been here two weeks or two decades. Um, and what happens is your name ends up on the historic roll to say, I was here and, uh, and this was important to me. So please uh, give us a call, either me on my email or at the church office and let us know if you'd like to become a member on June 5th and we will have a warm and wonderful welcome for you. We come today in the light of God that is all around us in the beauty of the sunshine, and we remember the light of God that burns always in our lives. Let us worship together.
I invite you to join me in the call to worship. Down at God's water is a place of prayer. The water of God invites us to come and heal. Jesus brought living water into the lives of thirsty people. Let's join together and sing. Shall we gather at the river? I would like to invite to the front any young ones and young at heart who would like to come. We're going to take a minute to draw some things today. So, Joanne, did you want to come? Sebi, did you want to come? I don't know. Jerome, do you want to come? Come on up. Excellent. Nice to see you. Now, we're going we're gonna to be right around here, but I'm going to ask you a question first. When I come to church and I'm going to talk a lot, which I'm going to do today, I bring this with me. You know what that is? Water. Water, exactly. What color do you think this is? White, clear. Do they make a crayon that color? No. No, they don't. Water doesn't seem to have much color. But we're going to talk about water and color. So, if you were going to draw, where do you see water? From the clouds, exactly. And in the ocean. So, what color is the ocean? Blue. Blue. All right. So, Sebi, why don't you draw blue ocean? And Jerome, do you draw? Yeah. 
Do you want to draw some blue ocean too? What color blue would you take? All right. We got blue ocean. Where else do you see water? In rain. What color is rain? Is rain. Rain is kind of clear. You can make the outline of that with that kind of a gold color. All right. Thank you for that. So we have blue ocean, nice swirls in the ocean. And we have clouds and raindrops. Has anyone ever seen a river that's a different color than blue? Oh, you got red. All right. What color rivers have you seen? Brown rivers. Let's do a brown river. You want to do a brown river? What other color rivers have you seen? Green rivers. Oh, no. Who wants to draw a green river? No, not you. You're doing red. Okay. <laughs> Jerome, you can do a green river. What about, has anyone been to China? They have a very famous river there. Yellow River. Who knew there was a yellow river? What makes a river yellow? What is it? Minerals. The minerals, maybe. Oh, Jerome's got a yellow river going. Excellent. Now, what about, let me think. Uh, do you ever eat fruit that's juicy? Like, what's your... Mango. What color is a mango? Yellow. Yellow. Right. All right. We can draw a mango, a juicy mango that's got some water in it. Nice. I'm going to draw another person. Now, what about... I'm going to draw a face here because I want to ask a question. Arthur, I'm going to... Sh I'll I'm going to make a face here with eyes and kind of a sad mouth. Now, when you're sad or hurt, you're, uh, something starts to happen in your eyes. Water. Water happens in your eyes. Right, you get tears. Yes. Exactly. Did, any, did you want to have some... What color would you color tears, Arthur? There's a brown. Yeah. Sure, you could do tears there. That's a good color. Yeah, just come on up. You can draw some tears on the face there. What else has water in it? Oh, very good. Yep, exactly. Two tears. Thank you, that's enough. <laughs> we don't want too many tears, right? So we've got butterflies, we got ocean, we got tears, we got fruit, we got, oh my goodness. Now if you step back, look at all the colors of water. Isn't that amazing? When you think you can't see it, and it shows up in all different colors. And I think God is kind of like that. Sometimes people think they can't see God, but God shows up in all kinds of different ways, in us and around us, and we can see God in all kinds of beautiful ways. I love this poster. All right, we're going to leave that up for the rest of it. And we have two people, Shirley and Chris, who are going to share in Godly Play. And so we'll put the crayons back here. And at the end of the service, if you want to come back and draw more, you can do that. You people are fantastic. Thank you. Have a wonderful time with your leaders in Godly Play. Thank you.
The first reading is taken from the Gospel according to John, chapter 5, verses 1 to 9. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an, infirm an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Our second reading is taken from the book of Acts chapter 16 verses 9 to 15. I'm reading from today's English version. And our previous reason, reading was from the New King James Version. So this one from today's English version. That night, Paul had a vision in which he saw a Macedonian standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. As soon as Paul had this vision, we got ready to leave for Macedonia because we decided that God had called us to preach the good news to the people there. We left by ship from Troas and sailed straight across to Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis. From there, we went inland to Philippi, a city of the first district of Macedonia. It is also a Roman colony. We spent several days there. On the Sabbath, we went out of the city to the riverside, where we thought there would be a place where Jews gathered for prayer. We sat down and talked to the women who gathered there. One of those who heard us was Lydia from Thyatira, who was a dealer in purple cloth. She was a woman who worshiped God, and the Lord appeared, the Lord opened her mind to pay attention to what Paul was saying. After she and the people of her house had been baptized, she invited us, come and stay in my house if you have decided that I am a true believer in the Lord. And she persuaded us to go. These are stories of our faith. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the early 1900s, my grandfather made his way from Ontario to Saskatchewan to homestead a place of land that was in the southwest corner of that new province. It was near to an area that came to be known as the Great Sand Hills. He arrived with his brother with a couple of oxen and a cart and some materials to start a farm. On that vast prairie grassland, they searched out a stake in the ground that indicated where the corners of their farm would be. The first thing they needed once they found their land was a drilled well for themselves and their animals. Most of the water in that area is underground and you had to find a good place to dig. They would likely have used the services of a dowser people with an innate or learned ability to locate water underground. Pretty much every rural community had dowsers. Traditional dowsers would use a Y-shaped willow stick. Some used thin copper rods, and they'd sort of tip down when the water became apparent. I heard of a man in one community where I served who used the steering wheel and the drive shaft from a Model T Ford. <laughs> People said he looked very silly out there driving back and forth on the empty prairie without the body of a car around him. But he was reliable and led people to water. Some people swear by dowsers, water witchers, whatever they're called. Some say it's all superstition. But real or not, everyone knows that without water, there is no life. Both of the biblical readings that Irene read this morning take place by the water. In one story, people are drawn to it for a place to be healed. And in the other story, they are seeking a place to pray. Both motivations still bring people to the water today all over the world. In the reading from the Gospel of John, we have a description of healing water. There was a pool in the old city of Jerusalem called Bethzatha or Bethesda. The name could mean house of kindness, or house of mercy, or house of flowing water. And the sick, and the pained, and the paralyzed, and the blind gathered there in great numbers. And in the text we read this morning, there was a line that explained the qualities of this healing pool. It said, at a certain time, an angel went down into the pool and stirred up the water. And the first person in, once it was stirring, would be healed. Now, I pictured something like the old faithful geyser in Yellowstone Park, where people kind of gather and they wait. It erupts 20 times a day, and they go, wow, that's amazing. One scientific explanation for a swirling pool like this is that it could have been an intermittent pond. That water flowed into it at certain times from an underground spring and then evaporated or slowly drained down and out. So there was a swirling time and an ebbing time. 
Whatever it was, the man in the story tells Jesus that he is never the first to get down in that pool when the water is stirring. The reading said he'd had an infirmity for 38 years. We don't know what it was, but he was a chronic sufferer. And he was either not quick enough or not well enough or didn't have enough friends to get him down to the water when it was swirling. Someone else always got in first. So from a distance, Jesus gives him what he needs to stand up and walk and take his mat and go. This man finds healing even by being beside the water. The second reading from the book of Acts is about Paul. And he follows the prompting of a dream. A Macedonian shows up in a dream and says, please come help us. And so they go right away and they help. And they got there for a few days and were in the city. And he waited for the Sabbath. And he went out looking for people of faith. And he didn't look in the city for a building. Maybe he noticed that there was no synagogue in the, build, in the city. He'd been there for a few days, so he left the city and he went to the river, hoping to find people at prayer, and he did. He found a group of Jewish women gathered there. He talked to them and taught them, and Lydia heard God's prompting in what he was saying, and she offered her home and her hospitality and her wealth to the work of Paul's mission. By the edge of the water, she was open to where the Spirit was leading. We talked in Bible study about sacred experiences that people have in, under, on, or around the water. Everyone had a time that was memorable. People remembered something beautiful or peaceful or buoyant, or refreshing, or magical, or powerful, or joyful. There is something about water that opens us up to spiritual moments. We are drawn to it. It is a widespread human need, and water is part of faith and healing all over the world. Some sacred water experiences are incorporated into religious practices, both private and public. In the Christian tradition, baptism is about the gift of new life. This one taking place in the Jordan River, where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. The Holy Ganges River in India is home to many religious traditions and dozens of their practices and festivals are connected to the water. There are religious traditions that are thousands of years old, like the Jewish celebration of Rosh Hashanah, when people gather by the water to release their sins and start again. And there are more recent celebrations, like this Epiphany celebration. Maybe only 30 or 40 years since they've been doing this, people come to celebrate the coming of the light in the frozen January lakes in Russia. Sometimes the healing and sacred properties of the water are meant for drinking. People believe they can share in ancient miracles in water from some places like this, Lourdes in France. Or from Bridget's Well in Ireland. Or the Well of Eternal Youth on the Scottish island of Iona. Sometimes the healing properties of water are about the purity of their source like artesian wells in Fiji that bubble up through fine filters of volcanic rock. 
or waters flowing in the Canadian Rockies from glaciers millions of years old. Or fresh water melting from icebergs in the salty northern and southern oceans. Tasting and drinking and touching pure and miraculous water is healing for many. And people make pilgrimages to find and experience these places. But as the story of the man waiting to get in at the pool of Bethesda, many of the sacred and healing places of water are freshwater sources or mineral springs that are meant to put your whole body in, to float, to soak, and to let the water cure you. This is a lake outside of Edmonton called Lac St. Anne, after Jesus' grandmother. It's one of the places the Pope is going to visit this summer. Every July, people make an annual pilgrimage to this lake that it's known for its healing properties. But long before the Catholic Church ever saw this lake or named it, the indigenous people of the area also recognized its healing qualities. The Nakota Sioux people who lived on the lake called it Wakamni, or God's Lake. And the Cree people who also live there have called it Manito Sakahigan, Spirit Lake. It has been a place of gathering, prayer, and healing for centuries. There are healing falls and pools in New Zealand. This one at Byron Bay. <coughs> <coughs> its indigenous name is Kavanba, which means meeting place, and was a place of peace where the tribes from the north and the tribes from the south of the Bunjalung people came together to meet. Throughout Japan, there are healing and sacred falls, places of prayer and meditation like these at Shiraito. This is a freshwater paradise in Brazil known as Blue Mango Hole or the Healing Hole. There are places like in the city of Bath, England, whose ancient hot mineral springs were channeled into pools 2,000 years ago by the Romans for their many famous baths. These pools are cared for to this day by Queen Elizabeth's royal decree to protect and care for them. She made it over 500 years ago. The mineral springs tell you what concentration of minerals are in the water and how they will help you and heal you. There are natural hot thermal pools that drain into ever cooler ponds, like these ones in Turkey, or Hot Springs Cove on the west coast of Vancouver Island, accessible only by boat. Members of the Asuhat First Nation are hosts and guardians of the water and the surrounding park. This hot spring is in Kitaga Kitagata, Uganda. It's called Milagu, after the region's largest hospital. This is an outdoor hospital every day sees hundreds of people coming here to find healing and community and comfort. From the pools of equatorial Africa to the Blue Lagoon in Iceland, people make their way to find warmth, healing, and relief. Some of the minerals are incredible salt concentrations that color the water, like in Hillier Lake in Australia, the pink salt lake. 
Traditional Aborigine people have a creation story, a dreamtime story connected to a great snake who came and turned the water pink. And of course, there is the Dead Sea in Israel. Its super concentrated salt composition gives incredible buoyancy that relaxes joints and muscles and allows you just to float. Water brings healing, community, peace, and spiritual connection in many forms. And we are not the only species that longs for that comfort, that warmth, and the sacred gathering that happens in the global gift of water. Chuang Tzu was a Chinese philosopher born 350 years before Jesus. And he wrote, water is the blood of the earth and flows through its muscles and veins. It is accumulated in heaven and earth and stored up in various things of the world. It comes forth in metal and stone and is concentrated in living creatures. Therefore, it is said that water is something spiritual. We are drawn to water. Even being in sight of it gives us life. Real estate people will be the first ones to tell you that they are eager to sell places with even a peekaboo view of the water because just a glimpse of water is enough to add value. There's a professor from Stanford University named Jay Nichols who wrote a book called Blue Mind. You don't even have to read the book, just the subtitle, and you'll have the whole thing. It's called The Surprising Science that shows how being near, in, on, or underwater can make you happier, healthier, more connected, and better at what you do. Being around water, oceans, lakes, or rivers calms us and elevates positive emotions promotes attentiveness, concentration, and creativity. It has curative effects on many health problems, including PTSD, depression, addictions, autism, pain, anxiety, stress, attention disorders. It can hasten healing from surgery, illness, and injury. Being near water has the same health and well-being benefits as prayer and meditation. The water's edge is a metaphor for the place where there is life, there is healing, spiritual fulfillment, the place where there is God. But rivers and waters are more than metaphors. They are entities in God's world who call us to practice justice. Because it is not just us who need healing, from the water, it is the water that needs healing from us. It is a reciprocal relationship. Water is under siege all over the planet. There's the great Pacific garbage patch swirling in the Southern Ocean made of trash and microplastics. It's a trash island the size of BC and Alberta combined. And while aquifers in Fiji and other pure water places send bottled water all over the world, some Fijians are left without fresh water to drink themselves. Irrigation in arid places is drying up rivers and depleting underground water sources. Untreated waste and plastics are pouring into some of the holiest rivers of the world, millions of tons a day. And in too many places, public water is being put in the care of private interests. The world's waterways call us to practice justice, to restore them to make sure that rich and poor alike have access to water's healing and life-giving properties. As humans so deeply connected to water, we need to learn to use 
and to manage water with creativity and forethought. One of my favorite writers in the church is an Episcopal laywoman named Diana Butler Bass. She makes her living writing and was struggling at one point with writer's block. A friend told her to go to the river to cure it. She lived near the Potomac River in the eastern U.S. She didn't want to go. An early European settler named John Smith had written home about the river 350 years ago. He said it was like a paradise filled with fish and wildlife. And she knew that was not the reality now. She thought it would make her too sad to go there. But she decided to go anyway. She saw a very different river than John Smith had seen. It was polluted. The trees were smaller, the water dirtier, the fish far fewer. But the longer she stayed, the more she learned from it. She wrote, you feel its power. And you feel it fighting for its life. Its currents carry the memory of place, of the native peoples, of the many stories that unfolded on its shores. There are turtles and frogs. A few beaver have returned, as have the eagles. There are cattails, wild irises, and honeysuckle. Trash floats by, too especially plastic bags and water bottles. But there are human beings who are wildly protective of this river, who pick up after their more careless kin. The water still can speak to us. We may need to spend more time listening for the direction of the Spirit when we go down to the river to pray or heal. The Bible begins with water, divided between heaven and earth, and it ends with water. The final scene in the book of Revelation is the river of God. And John has this vision and hears these words. To the one who is thirsty, I will give water, free of charge, from the spring of the water of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, water as clear as crystal, pouring out from the throne of God and of the Lamb, flowing down the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river is a tree of life, producing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month of the year, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. That final biblical vision the water of life in the center of our lives, bringing healing for everyone. That's God's vision. A few weeks ago, Bryn sent me the suggestion for a choir anthem today. It was from a 13th century Icelandic poem that was set to music in the last century, 700 years later. It's a haunting, beautiful piece of someone calling for healing. Bryn said learning to sing in the Icelandic language was a challenge. But this song sounds like it was meant for the water's edge and the hope and healing that lies there, both for the people and the water.
Dear God, fill our souls with the knowledge and comfort of your love as we pray. We begin, our, we begin our prayers thinking of those across the province, in particular those communities of faith in the Pacific Mountain Region Council. Our prayers are with all of these faith communities, whether they be long-established communities, specialized ministries, or more recently formed plant ministries. Today in the cycle, we pray for the We Are One Church plant of Point, Point Port Hardy, Webster's Hunak United Church, Weird Church Plant of Cumberland, West Point Gray United Church, West Vancouver United Church, West Bank United Church, West Shore Church Plant of Victoria. God, may, be you, may you be with these congregations. We thank you, God, for the miracle of water. Thank you for warm, soothing baths for the awakening and cleansing that comes with a morning shower, for the coolness of a glass of fresh, clean tap water. We are grateful for these gifts of water. Thank you for our proximity to water in this beautiful city. We cherish our walks along beaches, seeing the ships with their holes at different levels, marveling at the long stretch of mucky sand at low tide. We cherish our walks around Trout Lake as the off-leached dogs enjoy their freedom to fetch, swimming in the lake waters. Our walks and bike rides along the seawall connect us with the beauty of water. Water brings joy, community through shared experience, and connection with God's spirit. We are grateful for the lakes, rivers, and ocean shorelines and inlets of British Columbia. These waters bring us an abundance of riches, oysters, mussels, halibut, salmon, spot prawns. We thank the original inhabitants of this land who through their traditional knowledge have served as stewards, as preservers of your gifts for many, many centuries. We pray that more recent settlers respectfully, respectfully work with knowledge holders of these traditional ways to continue this sacred stewardship. We pray for all who suffer. We pray for all marginalized people. We pay, pray for the strength and wisdom to recognize and work to change the laws, attitudes, and hatred that negatively impact them. We pray for the family of Chelsea Poorman, the long missing young Cree woman whose body was recently found in Shaughnessy. We pray for all indigenous people in Canada as they come to terms with the impact of the residential school system, as they determine what actions with mass graves will help them heal, and as they prepare for the visit of the Pope. We pray also for the first forward redevelopment of the First United Church site that aims to provide safe and inclusive housing and amenities. The building comes down this week. Help us to end the hatred in this world, the irrational and dangerous fear of those who are different. We pray for the families of those who were killed last Sunday in Buffalo by an individual who hates blacks. We pray for the victims of seemingly unprovoked attacks, perhaps based simply on the fact that the, vision, the victims are Asian, LGBTQ2+, different in some way. We also pray for all those who carry this hatred in their hearts and for leaders that use this hatred to gain power. Help us to see how we can bring peace and love and work for unity. We offer up our prayers for those in our community. We pray for Karen recovering from surgery. We pray for all people who are feeling the keenness of loss and grief at this time. We pray for those in need, physical need, spiritual need. God, hear the prayers in our hearts as we now think of those who need your love and our love.
We pray these things in the name of Jesus, as we pray according to the New Zealand version of the Lord's Prayer. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God, in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name, echo through the universe. As you go from this place, may you be aware of the incredible miracle that is within you and all around you, God's blessing of water. And may the blessing of God give us hope and refreshment and peace and healing for those you love and yourselves. Amen. <laughs>